Dave? Yep. Um, do you have every single track somehow grouped going through the analog domain, or do you let some stuff go to the left right mix bus directly? Oh, I know what you mean. Like, yeah, sometimes, uh, well, in this case, everything was going through the console. Did you ever mix it? Uh, what do you mean by mixing like, it? Let some stuff go directly to and let only, only some groups go to the console. Well, I mean, like I said, I'm always listening. Uh, yeah, I do do that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Have you done any time alignment for the delay? Well, what, um, what I do most of the time, if I'm doing that, uh, it's not in any kind of a parallel situation. It's uh, where it's, um, yeah, exactly. So there wouldn't be any parallel issues. So, and if it's, you know, if it's like samples, it's fine. It's, that doesn't make a difference. Yeah. So, um, but I, re I really do that. I'm pretty much either uh, summing it out over like 16 faders or sometimes eight or whatever, but 16, uh, going through the console, or I'm just sending it out, to, uh, or, or I'm mixing, mixing completely in the box, just listening to the output from Pro Tools through here, and then sometimes what I'll do is then I'll, I'll take that stereo mix and run it through some faders and try some different options. After I've been mixing in the box, I'll be like, all right, well, I wonder if this will be sound better if I bus it into some, you know, this hardware compressor or, or this... EQ or this combination or, you know, just, just try some different styles of compression and EQ. Um, and then very often, depending on what the project is and, and expectations, like certain things, like um, I do a lot of the music for Sons of Anarchy and these kind of things I have to be fully stemmed out and stuff and just keeping it completely in the boxes is the only way to really do it. And uh, so if, if I know it's like a rock and roll thing like this, where it, after we're done, there's no real label. It's just me and Phil and Joey. And once we sign off on it, it's great. It's done. We don't have to play it for the president of the label or any of our a &R guys and have it go up the chain with their comments. And the promotion guy says it needs to be drier or whatever. Uh, so, you know, so now, we, you know, we, so in that case, I'm, I have no fear about just, it's, it's easy to just uh, go with it, rock and roll. But if it's going to be tweezed and looked at over weeks, months, whatever, I want it to be as instantly recallable as possible. And that's just kind of the nature of the business these days. And also, just on that, on that subject, I got to say, we were talking about this uh, before in the uh, lounge. I, I love working like this where I'll, I'll have literally five, six projects at a time that I'm bouncing back and forth and they're all at different stages. Some are just ending, some are in, right in the middle, some is just a, just a song here or there. And to be able to just work on them to the point where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of this song, I don't want to listen to it anymore, but I, st but I still want to work. And, and so I, I just go to another song and I'm inspired. I say, let's open up this other one and then work on that for three or four hours until I'm like, okay, it's time to take a break. And then you know, if, if it's an album, if, you know, if we're doing a whole album to do like three songs in one day and just kind of get them like all pretty much there and then listen to them, get a big picture feel for it, maybe send them to the artist or maybe just go to another three songs the next day and all of a sudden you've got a big picture read of what the whole thing is that I can now better dial in all the things having learned what the big picture is, you know what I mean? Like sometimes you even start playing with a sequence before the mixes are done, but you just kind of get a sense for how the album's going to flow, and it's just it's going to make your life easier because you you know what the big picture is, and you just instinctively uh, start making small decisions on each little song to make it all tie together, you know? Yeah. Hey, I got a question. Um, considering the guys recorded it at home. Um, when you dropped it in, how much gain trimming or filtering that you had to do, you know, prior to your mix? Oh, yeah. I, you mean like sometimes when people give you stuff and it's just recorded way too hot? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that was certainly a problem for a while, and, and sometimes it still is. Uh, yeah, if that's the case, I, well, now with, with, uh, with 10, with gain clip, I can do it like that kind of quick and easy and, and 
it cuts it right at the source kind of, you know. Um, but other than that, I just put a trim plug in on top or if, if on a plug in whatever is the first plug in in my chain, just knock the input down on that because that is definitely a problem when, when plugins are just overloaded and it just doesn't sound good. So yeah, that's, I'm glad we all finally came to that <laughs> realization about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, it seems like everybody caught on to that. So, uh, and that, that is a key with, uh, you know, with, with digital too, it seems that, you know, at, at first, you know, I, I started with digital audio when it first came out, like working on the Sony F1 in like 1987. If I, you guys don't even know what that is. But, uh, you know, we, the idea was to fill up all the bits. You know, that was what they always said. You have to use all those, every one of those bits. You got to soak them up. <laughs> so, you know, and we're like, okay, yeah, we'll make sure. I was like, oh, okay, it's almost at the red there. That's perfect. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, all right, so we got our session back here now, though. Um, let's see, we, we were just looking at the drums, I believe. Uh, 